already heard Satish once tonight, it's, it's, you're going to enjoy this, you're going to enjoy this. Um, just to say, welcome to St John's um, in Keynesham. Uh, my name's Simon, if you don't know who I am, I'm uh, one of the priests here. Uh, I'm also the Interfaith Advisors of the Bishops of Bath and Wells, and this kind of falls under that, uh, that category. Um, I'm welcoming you, though, not just on behalf of myself, which includes Churches Together in Keynesham, also uh, on behalf of Keynesham Fair Trade, uh, who have done sterling work tonight with the bar. Uh, and uh, and the uh, bits and pieces for that. And if you want to know more about uh, Cambridge and Fair Trade, then Graham is the, their current um, chair, and he's uh, right over there in the corner. Not the chair, but I'm very happy to talk about. <laughs> he's not that chair at all. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Absolutely rubbish. Um, so, secondly. Um, uh, Transition Keynesham, uh, a superb organisation um, uh, dealing with the twin problems of uh, climate change and peak oil and, uh, and making that very local to Keynesham and uh, so I welcome you on behalf of them as well uh, and uh, can I just uh, ask um, Laura and Mary and David to put their hands up? They're all in the same area over there. That's the place to go after the meeting, is to see those people over there and you can talk to them about that. Um, also Keynesham Creative Enterprise Hub uh, and Keynesham Kind, but uh, William, who runs those, is not here tonight, so you can talk to me about those uh, if you want to. Now, what, what's, what's tonight about? I'm, I'm sure many of you are here because you are concerned about the uh, state of the planet. You love the planet, and you're concerned about the state of the planet and what's happening to it. And uh, I think we're all aware that we need spiritual guides uh, into this, uh, the desecration of the planet to try and make sense of it and try and have a, a different story. I was so struck uh, uh, in the earlier session that we had in Bath City College just now um, that uh, Satish presents a very different story. Uh, and, and it's one we really, really need to hear. Uh, and it's very, very important. And uh, so I do encourage you to listen uh, on that basis. Uh, uh, Satish is a former Jain monk. Um, he's a long-term peace and environmental activist. He's a world-renowned ecologist. He's the founder of the Schumacher College International Center for Ecological Studies. He's the editor of Resurgence magazine, but you've heard about that. Um, and, uh, uh, and he's going to speak tonight uh, on reverential ecology. Um, and I do encourage you to put your hands together uh, for Satish Kumar. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very impressed with the turnout. I didn't know that I was so well known in uh, this area. Uh, but thank you very much for coming. I'm going to talk about reverential ecology. You have heard of deep ecology? It was Arne Ness, a great philosopher from Norway, who made this distinction between shallow ecology and deep ecology. And I said to Arne that I respect deep ecology, I love deep ecology, but deep is not necessarily good. You can be in a deep hole. <laughs> so we need to go a step further than deep ecology. And so I coined the term reverential ecology. Now, shallow ecology, let's start with shallow ecology. Shallow ecology considers nature conservation as important but only because it is useful to humans. It's anthropocentric in rather sort of jargon word. It's a human-centered worldview. Humans are in the center. We are special and we are the superior species. And all the natural world out there is there for one purpose and one purpose only. And that purpose is to serve human needs. And therefore, as shallow ecologists, we will say, therefore, we need to take care of the environment. We need to take care of nature. We need to take care of the animals and the oceans and the rivers and the forests so that humans can benefit for a long, long time, a sustainable future for humanity. That's a shallow ecology. Deep ecology says that's not good enough. That is not enough because we humans have this kind of human imperialism. 
We are the rulers of the world. And all the natural world, the forests and the rivers and the mountains and the land, is only to, for us. So there's a kind of human arrogance. We need to move from there and we have to say nature has intrinsic value. Now that's a great step forward. Trees are there not just because they are useful to us and therefore they are good. Not just because they give us oxygen, they give us shade, they give us fruit, they give us wood for our fire, they give us wood for our floor, our buildings. But trees are good in themselves. Trees were there before humans came on this planet. Evolution. The oceans and mountains were there before humans came on the picture, on the scene. How can we say the humans are superior and all the forests and all the mountains and all the rivers and all the oceans and all the fishes and all the deer, everything is for us, for our use. They were here before we came. Remember evolution. Remember your, your college and, and, and school books. So nature was there before we came. So nature has intrinsic value. Nature has right to be pristine and clean and live. Rivers have rights. Forests have rights. Not just human rights, but rights of nature. That's a deep ecology. Deep ecology will say the nature is good in itself. But reverential ecology says that yes, yes to that. But nature is also sacred. The life is sacred. And therefore, we need not only to recognize that nature has intrinsic value, there's a kind of intellectual recognition. But with our heart and soul and spirit, we have to have a sense of gratitude to nature. Now, gratitude is a spiritual quality. And the spiritual <coughs> tradition of all religions Christians, Hindus, Taoists, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhists, Sikhs, all the religions have this deep tradition. And among you Christians, you will know our patron saint of ecology was St. Francis. And he was the father of the reverential ecology. He spoke with the chickens and the wolf. He was not afraid of wolf. He spoke with wolf. And he looked after chicken and he talked to trees. Now people say Prince Charles talks to trees and therefore he must be weird. But St. Francis talked to animals and trees. He was not weird. He was a saint of ecology, patron saint of ecology. And then we have a great tradition in our Christian and Hindu and Taoist traditions. But particularly now, I was just speaking with one of my great friend, Martin Palmer. In, in Bath he lives, and he has a kind of religious organization, an ecology and conservation religion. And he was saying that now there's a new awareness among Christians and among Muslims and among many, many other religious groups, planting trees, taking care of the land, taking care of the animals, being compassionate in farming, and not put animals in factory farms, in cruel conditions. And, and, and respect the animals, even though we take their life for our food, if you are not vegetarian, I am. But uh, even if you take uh, meat from the animals, you keep them in good condition, in organic and free-range conditions, so that while they are alive, they are happy. And when you eat meat of happy animals, your health is better. But if you eat meat of unhappy, cruelly brought up, and reared and, and, and farmed animals, then that unhappy meat will go in your body and you will get cancer and heart disease and many other problems. Even Harvard University has recognized it. And it was in yesterday's papers and today's papers, their study that too much red meat as coming from factory farms, unhappy animals, is the cause of lots of our modern diseases like cancer and heart problems. And so, these great religious traditions, but even without religious traditions, reverence for life is a human 
impetus. It's a human, human, uh, human nature to be generous, to be kind, to be kind to all animals and all nature. So reverential ecology recognizes the gratitude. Now trees give us fruit. We take the fruit. We take the wood for our floor, for our beams, for our houses. We say, thank you, trees. That gratitude, thank you, trees. What a wonderful tree you are. From that one little apple seed, which I planted 20 years ago, that one tree came from that tiny, tiny seed. The whole tree came. And from that tiny seed, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of apples for one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year, 50 years depending on the kind of tree you have. What generosity. And you want to learn the unconditional love, unconditional love, which the Bible teaches, and the Quran teaches, and the Torah teaches, and the Bhagavad Gita teaches. Unconditional love. You don't need to go to Bible and Quran and Bhagavad Gita. Go to the apple tree. When you go to the apple tree, full of apples, red and fragrant wow aroma and you go you want apple your mouth is watering apple tree never says have you come with your visa card <laughs> apple tree says come come i'm ready for you ripen sweet juicy aromatic and doesn't know no discrimination you are educated, uneducated. Have apples. For a saint or a sinner, have apples. Even in prisons, you can have apples. Educated, uneducated, black, white, young, old. Not only humans, but humans or animals, or even wasps or bees. Everybody can have apples. Unconditional gift generosity of the apple tree. We have to have a gratitude to that generosity. And that gratitude to nature is reverential ecology. We revere nature. We revere apple trees, mango trees, oak tree, ash tree. Even the brambles give you such sweet blackberries. Even the brambles, which you want to get rid of. But in September, come September, my wife and I go with a little, little bucket or bowl in our hand and in this, through these uh, uh, thorny uh, <coughs> leaves we get these lovely black juicy and then apples at the same time. I have 15 apple trees. I have two acres of land and I know what a wonderful apple and, uh, and blackberry uh, crumble is delicious. <laughs> with a Devon clotted cream, you remember. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also a gift of nature. The cows give you such a wonderful cream. Everything comes from nature. Our life is sustained by nature. But we have somehow, in our educated mind, scientific mind, we have come to believe that nature is only there, nothing. We humans are so special. We have mind, we have intelligence, we have consciousness. Nature has mind. Remember. Nature has soul. Remember. <coughs> Descartes said animals have no soul. <coughs> animals have no soul. They're called animals. Anima means soul. And Descartes, he considers himself philosopher and scientist. But he did not know animals have soul. But I say not even animals. Trees have souls. Flowers have souls. Grass have souls. Intelligent. The apple seed knows exactly what to be. To be or not to be is not a question. It might have been a question for Shakespeare, but not a question for apple tree and apple seed. It is their seed to be an apple tree, without any doubt. Memory is there. Intelligence is there. It will never be confused. Shall I be apple or pear? Shall I be apple or oak? Should I be apple or something else? No question, no doubt. Humans have doubt. Should I be doctor or engineer? Should I be a businessman or a priest? But apple tree has no doubt. It knows its, its true being. And so tree, trees are our teachers. 
My mother used to say that little boy, revere the trees. Why mother? This is our teacher. Greatest teacher in the world, my mother used to say, are the trees. Even greater than the Buddha. Can you imagine? I doubt it. I said to my mother, mother, that can't be true. There is no greater teacher than the Buddha in India. He was our greatest teacher. Everybody says. Then mother would say, little boy, dear boy, where did Buddha get his enlightenment? While sitting under a tree. And nowadays we don't get enlightenment because we don't sit under a tree. <laughs> when the Buddha was sitting under the tree, he realized the interdependence and the harmony of the universe. The sun in harmony with the tree and the rain in harmony with the tree and the birds coming and sitting on the tree and tree um, taking nourishment from the soil and that nourishment is producing fruit and the fruit is giving uh, uh, nourishment to people and the birds and the wasps and the soil. All the connectedness, interconnected, interdependent, interrelated, we are all related. The moment you realize my mother's teaching, the moment you realize that we are all related in this planet Earth, all the birds flying in the sky are our kith and kin. The deer in the forest, our brother and sister, even the tiger and elephants, even the snake, even the earthworm. Without the earthworm, there will be no food on our table. The earthworm work day after day without a weekend without a holiday, without any even minimum wage. And we say, well, earthworms, nothing. What arrogance. Earthworm, nothing. Long live the earthworms. <laughs> if there were no earthworms, there would be no Darwin. Darwin did his research and he came to his evolution studying earthworms. And so the moment we have that gratitude, we have a reverence. And when we have a reverence, we are one. We are nature. We are nature. Nature is not just out there. Whatever is born is nature. Native, natal. When a mother is pregnant, she goes for a prenatal check with her midwife. After the birth, midwife comes to your home for a postnatal check. Is everything okay after the birth? Natal means birth. Natal, nature, native, they all come from the same root, nativity. Natal in, in South Africa was found on a Christmas day, on the birthday of Jesus Christ. So it's all related to birth. Humans are born. Are we not born? Therefore we are nature. Nature does not belong to us. We belong to nature. We are all nature. And therefore what we do to nature, we do to ourselves. If we destroy nature, if we pollute our river, that beautiful Avon River, in your, uh, in your Bath and Bristol area and a beautiful all the other rivers. They are our vein. We are earth, air, fire, water, space, time, history, consciousness, imagination. Everything but in the universe is in, in us. The sun, without the sun, we cannot survive. Moon, without the moon, we cannot be. We are miniature universe, microcosm of the macrocosm. And therefore, the moment we realize this expansive consciousness, the moment we expand our consciousness and we say, we are nature and we are members of the earth community and members of human community, all our narrow, petty um, uh, sort of uh, disconnections that I am English and not American and I am Indian and not Pakistani, and I am a Hindu, not a, not a Christian, and I am a Muslim, not a Buddhist, and I am intelligent and uh, educated in Oxford and Cambridge, and not a Bristol boy, etc., etc. All these disconnections. We are all members of one earth community and one human community. I was in Pakistan, and Pakistani Muslims, and I am Indian, Hindu, or Jain, and they say, welcome. And my people were saying, but you are going to Pakistan, walking without money, without food. How are you going to survive? And I come to Pakistan, so much welcome. So I say to my friends that if I go there as an Indian, we meet a Pakistani. If I go as a Hindu, I meet a Muslim. 
For if I go as a human being, I meet human beings everywhere. That is our primary identity. We are all human beings. An even greater identity for reverential ecology is that we are all members of the earth community. So that understanding, that consciousness, releases you from all your ego and burden. It's a transformation and it's a change from ego, this human ego, this collective ego, to eco. This one letter change from G to C and you have a transformation of your consciousness. And the moment you go from ego, this narrow identity, to ego, this great identity, you touch the mind of God. Hawking, uh, um, Hawking. Um, Stephen Hawking, this great scientist, wrote his book called Brief History of Time. And in the last paragraph of his book, he says, perhaps one day we will know the mind of God. I have to say to Mr. Hawking, scientist, you can know the mind of God here and now, at this moment. The moment you expand your consciousness and you are a miniature cosmos and all the cosmic forces and divine forces are in you and you are in the cosmos, you have touched the mind of God. There is nothing else. God is not somewhere behind the sky sitting there pulling strings. God is here, everywhere in the cosmos. The cosmic consciousness cosmic Christ. And so we need to move from this ego, this arrogance of humanism to eco. Eco, Greek word means home. Ecos, from which comes ecology and economy. Home, planet home, household, planet household. So the whole planet is our home. Bath is your home. Bristol is your home. England is your home. Europe is your home. Whole earth is your home, but the whole cosmos is your home. That is ecos. And so if you have a knowledge of that home, then it's ecology. You know how all the species relate to each other, how we all, all connect with each other. The moment you realize that, you become member of that earth community and a cosmic consciousness. But at the moment, we are so much obsessed with the economy that we have forgotten ecology. I was invited to speak at the London School of Economy. And I asked them, please tell me where is your department for ecology? They said, we don't have one. I said, do you know what economy and ecology means? Ecology means knowledge of ecos, the planet Earth, home. And economy means management of the planet home. Now, please tell me how you are going to manage something if you don't know what you are going to manage. Isn't that, isn't that rational, reasonable question? Now, you are sending these thousands upon thousands of graduates, graduated from the London School of Economics, going around the world, America, Africa, India, China, everywhere. London School of Economics is very international and very famous, big university. No wonder the world economy is in a mess. Because they don't know what to manage. So you must change your name. Call it not LSE, but LSEE, -E, London School of Ecology and Economy. Then you are walking on two legs. You have a complete picture. Ecology and economy go together. So the moment you have that understanding of the wholeness, the completeness, the interrelatedness, the interdependence of all living beings in that magnificent diversity of millions and millions of folds, like we each individual here, is separate, different, with different hair, different voice, different face, and yet we are all humans. So di diversity is to be celebrated, diversity to be cherished, but diversity only understood within the unity of this whole, the unity of this country, the unity of this planet Earth. Unless we have that sense of unity, our diversity can become very narrow. So our identity is greater than we think. I always think, oh, I'm an Indian, or I'm an editor of resurgence, or I'm this, or I'm that. Those are fine, no problem. 
with those narrow, small, secondary identities. But don't forget your primary identity, that you are a human being, but even greater than that, you are a member of the Earth community. And Earth is where we get our sustenance. Earth is where we get our nourishment. Earth is the real bank. I call it the Earth Bank. All your unemployment will vanish if you go to nature. At the moment, unemployment is rising because people have forgotten how to work with nature. They have forgotten how to use their hands. I was just speaking in this uh, city college, uh, um, Bath, city of Bath College. And I said, how are we using our hands apart from using our mobile phones <laughs> or computer keyboard? What are we doing with our hands? 15% of young students coming to LSE and big, other big universities don't know how to boil an egg. But they don't know how to use their hands. And they are unemployed. No wonder they are unemployed. It's the earth will give us employment. Garden. Make furniture. Build houses. I, I said to my students at LSE, that after your university graduation, don't go out seeking jobs. They said, wow, how are you going to live without jobs? I said, don't go out seeking jobs. Go out and create jobs. Your own jobs, with your imagination, with your creativity. Be a teacher, be a healer, be a farmer, be a gardener, be a builder, be a poet, be a painter, be a singer, be who you are. You have a tremendous capacity to be. Shakespeare was right. Humans don't know to be or not to be. And they are mostly not to be. We have to be who we are. And we have a great potential. We are capable of tremendous achievement and creativity. Every one of us have a potential, a potential to be a Gandhi, to be a Shakespeare, to be a Beethoven and Bach, to be a Picasso or Turner or, or Mozart. We have a capacity. We are all human beings born with great capacity, but our educational system, our various sort of families and so on, our economic system suppresses our creativity dampens our potential and we are only good to get a job some company will give you a Tesco or Sainsbury's or some car company or somewhere you have to get a job in the office or in the city or in the bank clerk we have been reduced to be a clerk millions of car clerks where are the genius poets and, and activists like Martin Luther King and Mother Teresa what happened to them so we have to go in that reverential ecology mindset so that we can discover our own soul, spirit, potential and, and creativity and imagination and be who we are. Ananda Kumaraswamy, the great Indian philosopher and artist said, an artist is not a special kind of person, but every person is a special kind of artist. We are all artists. But we have forgotten our art. We can all sing in the same way as we can speak our English language. We can all sing and write poetry in the same way as we can walk. As easy as that. But it's all destroyed, dampened, suppressed. Only thing you need reading, writing, arithmetic. Reading, writing, arithmetic. And what you read? Sun or defunct news of the world. <laughs> what else are you reading? So how many people are really reading good things? So reading, writing, arithmetic is okay. I started a small school in Heartland. And I said, before we teach you Shakespeare, before we teach you Darwin, science and other things, we have to teach you how to cook. You can learn Darwin and you don't know how to feed yourself. You can't eat Darwin. Before we teach you Shakespeare and Darwin, we'll teach you how to grow food in the garden. If you can know how to grow food, and see that seed becoming a tomato, red and juicy and delicious. Then you learn biology and science proper. So I started a school. I say to children, four days you have a class in the school. But fifth day, go out in nature. Don't take cameras, don't take pencil, no pen, no, no uh, sketchbook, nothing. Just go and observe nature. Be in nature. Identify with nature. Experience nature. Knowledge is not enough without experience. 
When knowledge and experience meet together, then wisdom is born. Without experience, there is no wisdom. We have so much knowledge and no experience and no wisdom in our modern world. And so reverential ecology is to bring that wisdom into the play. Reverential ecology is to create that love for nature, not fear. You become shallow ecologist because you say doom and gloom and global warming and, and, uh, and uh, pollution and, and uh, population explosion, resources depleting. Therefore, we have to be ecologists. No, no, no. We, we are not ecologists out of fear. We are not ecologists out of doom and gloom because of global warming. Global warming or no global warming, we are ecologists because we love nature. That's a reverential ecology. Love your neighbor as yourself. Neighbor, you have to expand the meaning of neighbor. We have been too human-centered thinking. The only neighbor is human neighbor. Your trees and your garden, your plant garden are your neighbors. The animals are your neighbors. The birds flying in your garden are your neighbors. Love your neighbor. When you have love of nature, love of the earth, love of people, love of community, that is true reverential ecology. No fear, no doom and gloom, whether there is the oil uh, depleting or not, peak oil or not, global warming or not. We will love nature. We will love the earth. We will revere the earth and we'll celebrate the flowers and celebrate the seasons and celebrate the beauty and aesthetics. And that celebration is true reverential ecology. Not doom and gloom, but celebration. I don't want to be part of an environmental, environmental movement which is filled with doom and gloom and disaster and, and, and pessimism and fear. I want to be part of an environmental movement with a dance and music and poetry and, and friendship and love of nature and walking in nature and swimming in the sea and swimming in the rivers. Why do you want to pollute our rivers? We want to swim them, in them. That is reverential ecology. So... I don't need to speak to this audience. You are already enlightened and you are aware of these things. But just I want to remind you what we have forgotten. And let's go back to our homes with this new consciousness that we have to love nature, we have to revere nature, we have to be grateful to nature, and we have to celebrate nature. Then all will be well. The problem solutions of our economy are not in the hands of Bank of England, not in the hands of David Cameron, not in the hands of... Um, uh, whichever Miliband it is. <laughs> it is in the hands of nature. It is in the hands of the earth. And it is in the hands of yourself. You are the true leaders. Leaders are not going to come out of 10 Downing Street or the Parliament or the Westminster or the White House or the Kremlin or anywhere else. The leadership comes from here. The true leadership, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, Dalai Lama, Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma, Bakhlab Havel, they were not office holders. They came from the people like you and I. And we remember them because they were true leaders. And we forget when George Bush went out of the White House, nobody talks about him. What kind of leader was he? <laughs> Leadership which comes with status and office and position and power and military and police, that's no good leadership. The true leadership is leadership of the heart, which comes from inside. But to be true leader and to be a real change maker and a change agent, you have to be the change you want to see in the world. Mahatma Gandhi said, there is no integrity if we just talk about these ideas, but if we don't live it. So the first step to be a good leader is to practice what we preach. So live our life in such a way which is in harmony with the earth in harmony with the natural world, in harmony with our neighbors, as much as possible. Reduce the conflict, be non-violent. Non-violence was the greatest teaching of Mahatma Gandhi and all other religions. Do no harm to others. So if we have that attitude, then we have a positive uh, ecology, which is reverential ecology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Did you say something? No, just questions. Questions, yeah. We have time for questions. So the question is the real time, because whatever I had to say, I said. But 
more spontaneous, more here and now. So please do. Uh, we have got plenty of uh, time, uh, 20 minutes or so. So please ask questions. Yes. Uh, I know you just said sort of, um, that we've got to be what we want it to, to be. Sort of yeah. thing. But have you any suggestions of how we can like have a greater impact on changing the people that don't seem to see any of this? <laughs> you know, the situation yes. Narrow-minded yes. people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, um, the reason I said be the change you want to see in the world is because the power of your example is greater than the power of words. But uh, that is not all. Power example is the starting point. That gives you the foundation upon which you build. But then you also need to communicate your thoughts, your ideas, your vision, your values, your ideals. And so communication skills are very important. So we all need to learn how to communicate. You can communicate through poetry, through songs, through plays, through novels, through writing, through, through gardening, through um, uh, organizing campaigns. You can communicate through many ways. And if 100 people here communicate with 10 other people, there will be 1,000. Mm -hmm. If 10 yeah. people, they communicate with each other, there will be 10,000. So exponentially, you can grow. So we need to live then we need to learn to communicate, and then we communicate. Organize. We have to organize little, little groups everywhere. Like you have come here today, there are 100 people. But meet in smaller groups, 10, 20, uh, 25, 30 people together, and read something together. Uh, have share a tea or coffee or some sandwiches together. And then talk about how you can bring about transition town, how you can bring about uh, more people gardening. If you are working five days a week, how you can start working four days a week. So you have one day to go out in nature. So together in a community, you bring those changes. That way you can build a big movement. Just by influence. Uh, yeah. Influence. So it will start somewhere. I feel it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Yes, please. Some people would say that money is the root of all evils. What would you say about that? <laughs> At the moment, it seems like that. When people say the economy is bad in Britain or in Europe, what they mean is not economy. They mean finance. The problems we face today are financial problems. Economy means land, labor, capital. Now, land has not said that I'm not going to produce any food. Labor, people have not said we are not going to work. So economy includes land, natural resources, and people. But it's the money has become the end in itself today. Money has become the end, and the land and the people have become the means, the instrument to make money, to make profit for company, for corporations, for big business, for global companies, multinational companies. And so uh, money was a good invention. It was easier to uh, exchange goods and services without carrying your bartering uh, sort of things. So it was a good invention, but it was means to an end. It was not wealth. It was a measure of wealth. But now we have changed that philosophy. And money has become root of all evils because of that change of philosophy. We have started to think that money is wealth in itself. So bankers are called wealth creators. They are not wealth creators. Wealth creators are our teachers, our gardeners, our farmers, our craftsmen, our builders, our land. They're the wealth creator. So money was not root of all evil when it was means to an end. But it has become roots of all evil because that has become like a god. And everything should be sacrificed at the altar of this money god. So humans are hired and fired for making profit and money. The land is bought and sold as investment to make money. Houses are bought and sold as investment. Art is bought and sold for money. Everything has become money. NHS for money. Save money or spend money. Education, if you have no money, departments close. Everything is measured in money. That is why it has become root of all evil. So if you put money in its place, then it has a place. I'm not against money per se. Money has a place, but please put it in its place. And don't allow it to dominate your life. Don't do anything for money. 
do it for your vocation, for your calling, for your art, for your imagination, for your creativity. And money should be to facilitate, to oil the wheels. Like when you are driving a car to come to, to this talk, you put petrol in it. But that's only a means to come in here. The real purpose is to come to this meeting. In the same way, money should be only a means to an end. At the moment, it has become root of all evil because money is obsessing. All our government is obsessed with money. All our financiers and banks and, and, and the shops, they're always measuring how much profit we are making. Are you serving the community? Are you looking after the earth? Are you looking after the land? Are you looking after the forest? Those should be the purpose. So money can be a good thing if it is used properly, but money becomes the root of all evil if it becomes on the pedestal. Yes, there. A couple of years ago, there was a very good program in Cajun put on by the church. It's called More to Life. And there were monthly meetings. So I remember going to one and the speaker similar to uh, uh, your subject tonight, and he finished his talk with three words. Con contraction and convergence. In other words, we in the developed world have to rein in our consumerism and allow the third world to come up. But th they will never be able to get to the level we're at now because the resources of the planet just aren't sufficient. How do we get that message across to our politicians? Uh -huh. uh, we have to say to our politicians that if everybody, seven billion people upon this earth, in India, China, South Africa, Brazil, South America, wherever they are, seven billion people, if they lived like we live in England, America, and France, and Europe, we will need three planets. We haven't got three planets. We have got only one. So we have to change our way of life. This is what we, message we have to give them. That we have to live elegant, comfortable, joyful, but simple life. That is the message we have to give. It's no, this kind of consumerism and this, this, this uh, obsession with economic growth. Everybody talking economic growth, economic growth, economic growth. Economic growth for what? If our families are breaking down, if communities are breaking down, if nature is falling apart, the rivers are polluted, and the forests are gone, and, 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 the, and the animals are in factory farms, no well-being, no good health, hospitals are full of ill people, cancers, a heart disease, uh, the, the surgeries are sort of waiting lists in hospitals. If there's no well-being and you have economic growth continuously, so what? And so we have to stop this uh, obsession with economic growth and put our faith in the growth of well-being. We did a special issue of resurgence, and you might have it here, a few copies, uh, issue of well-being. And so well-being should be put in the center. If we can put, and I think Messi is slowly getting through. David Cameron has been talking about well-being and Happy Planet Index, but it's only a kind of little, little, little thing. The, still, his obsession is economic growth, and so unless we change that obsession, and if Chinese and Indians and South Africans and Brazilians and all the rest of the seven billion people try to live and consume and be materialistic and wasteful like we are. This planet cannot be sustained. So we have to be realistic. These all educated politicians and economists are supposed to be realistic. What have the realists done? Made the mess of the world. And so we have to be a little bit also idealistic. Give idealists a ch chance. That's the answer. Is the question there? Well, my question was really along exactly the same lines. That the politicians are obsessed with uh, growth for short, short term resolution of problems, but in the long term it's kind of reductive. And that's just what you said. Yeah, absolutely. Even short term, in short term, if we go on economic growth, it will have a great negative impact on our environment, on our planet Earth. The economic growth requires a tremendous amount of use of fossil fuel. Now fossil fuel is running out, peak oil, we have reached already. For the oil, we have to go to wars like Iraq and other places and Iran. And, and if we use fossil fuel, it creates global warming, climate change. So economic growth is very much related to our environmental problems. 
So if we move from economic growth to more a circular economy, steady economy, where things come and go and come back, so circular economy rather than this linear economic growth, you cannot have unlimited economic growth on a finite planet. Simple, simple message they don't understand that you cannot have unlimited, infinite growth on a finite planet. So it has to have a, a circular economy where we are putting more emphasis on well-being and whatever we take from nature, we put back in nature. And when we put back in nature, nature will nourish us again. Like in nature, there's no waste. In nature, there's no growth, economic growth. Nature dies, born again. Nature dies, born again. There's a lot of growth in the tree when it stops, after a while, gives apples, but then after 50 years it dies. And apples also come to an end in the winter, and then there is a new fresh leaves and fresh apples. So the cyclical, we have to take nature as our teacher, nature as our mentor, and go in harmony with nature, with the grain of nature, rather than think that we humans are too clever, so we can conquer nature, we can, we can subjugate nature, we can do what we like. That consciousness needs to change. Yes. I agree with what you're saying. I don't, I don't see how you can move from like, a system where constantly uh, resource, land, all these things that you'd need to live that way are being constantly enclosed by, um, by people with money and, and the capitalist system is just taken and taken. How do you move to a situation where resources reallocated back to common, common use and common land without there being some sort of social... <coughs> political revolution. First of because all, people aren't going to give it up. First of all, you have to look at natural world not as a resource. Because if you look at it as a resource, then those who are clever and powerful and, and have power and force, they will take it. But if you make it as a commons, and it's not a resource, but it's a mother, mother nature. Revere, reverential ecology sees nature not as a resource, but as, um, as a source. Source is better than resource. And so, uh, it's a mother nature. We need to revere this, the, the, this earth and all the natural kind of gifts. Then, it should be available to everybody. So, we have to change this mindset where we think we can own. The nature is all resources. Land is a resource and we can own it. We cannot own nature as we cannot own our mother. Our mother is a mother, but we don't own mother. We have a relationship with mother. In the same way, we have to move from this ownership of nature to relationship with nature. So from ownership to relationship, then when the philosophy changes, when the values change, when the social ethos change, then the law and the practice will also change. But at the moment, we all believe in ownership. We all believe we can own nature. This is my river, this is my land, this is my animals, this is my this and my that. We cannot have that. It's a very big, tall order. Reverential ecology is a tall order to create a consciousness revolution. We are trustees of land. We take care of the land as long as we live. But land was here before we came, and land will be here after we have gone. Not only in our life, but even before humanity came, land was here. And even if what happens to humanity, I don't know. So, so this consciousness change is a first step in my view. But at the same time, you need to also campaign for social justice. You have to campaign uh, and create awareness for equality and equity or equity and an economy which is more just and fair. That kind of campaign is also necessary at the same time as we are trying to change the consciousness. And that will not happen just by leaving it to politicians or hoping somebody will do it. You have to be the leader. You have to be the leader. You have to, we are all leaders. We cannot expect somebody else is going to change. Mahatma Gandhi did not wait for somebody else to lead the independence movement. Martin Luther King did not wait. Rosa Parks did not wait. Mother Teresa did not wait. So we should not wait for somebody else to solve the problems. Take the lead. Yes. Um, when you talk about all of us being leaders in the room, do you have any kind of hints and tips for how to... Comment on? Do, do you have any kind of suggestions on how people can, can move into that kind of leadership 
role in their lives. Leadership role. Many people are kind of caught up in their jobs or their families or... Leadership. You know, leadership role. Yeah. 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 Um, the way to um, get into leadership role, first of all, you have to have time. We are all too busy in our jobs. We are too busy earning our living, which is, which is a difficult proposition because we need to somehow make our ends meet. However, you have to find a, a creative way of reducing your needs, simplifying your life so that you don't have to spend all five days from nine to five or longer to work, work, work and be exhausted. And the only thing you can do is to sit in front of TV or, or just relax. So if you were able to work for three days a week, then you have two days to meet people, to organize meetings, to write something, to write a book, to write a poem, to go and speak somewhere, like I've come here to speak, because I could spare the time. So need time. And in order to have time, you need to reduce your needs. So Mahatma Gandhi, what did he do? He went on a loincloth. Just a pair of center, although it's easy in India. <laughs> <laughs> I would not book it here. But as an, as an illustration, that you have to reduce your needs, simplify your life, so that you can live well with less uh, means, less earning, less money, and have time for organizing, for community work, for getting together, getting people to come together. So three days a work, a week work, four days a week work will be a good start. Then fifth day or fourth day, and the weekend you also need for the family. So I think time is first. The second is inform yourself. At the moment, we don't know enough about the situation in the world. We don't know enough about these values. We need to study. We need to understand. We need to read um, Aldo Leopold. We need to read E.F. Schumacher. We need to read Leopold Kohl. We need to re read um, Rachel Carson. We need to read uh, all these wonderful authors who have wisdom and who have knowledge and who have information. So when we are equipped with those tools uh, and information and knowledge, and we can share with a group of people, and we can uh, articulate our ideas. We need to learn how to speak. We need to learn how to sing. We need how to write a poem. We need how to communicate, how to make a nice poster, how to um, make a meeting attractive. All those things we need to learn. So when we can train ourselves in leadership, and that takes time, but you don't have to wait. Start, and more you do, better you will get. Find some time. Yes. How do you practice non-violence in your daily life? How do I practice non-violence in my daily life? First of all, I made a decision, whether it is my son or daughter or wife or neighbor or colleagues in my office, college, school, anywhere, I will not, I'll try, I will not be angry. Anger is the first beginning of violence. When you are angry, you are being violent to yourself. And then you speak words which are harsh. And then it's violence to others. And so when you start violence to yourself, that's the first big violence, even bigger than violence to others. <coughs> because violence to others happens only when you are violent to yourself. So I decided not to be angry. You can make that decision. It's not something that's beyond your control. If you know consciously and say, whatever the situation, I am going to solve those problems by sweet words. Even truth. You speak the truth, but speak it sweetly. If you don't know how to speak your words sweetly, learn how to speak your words sweetly and how to communicate with people who don't agree with you. So that kind of generosity, that kind of restraint, that kind of openness, but that kind of uh, training in your life, that is non-violence. And then I'm vegetarian. I try to tread lightly. I grow my food uh, in the garden. I have two acres of land. I have a little orchard. So I grow my apple. I make apple juice in September, October, and then I store the apples. So I try to live as locally as possible and, and try to be more non-violent to nature. So this way, you can make a beginning. But the most important thing, the beginning of violence is anger and, and harsh words. Speak sweetly. That's the beginning.
please. Um, I hear you. I hear. So I'm owning this. This is what I'm hearing. I hear you say, "Love the created." I'm not hearing you say, "Love the creator." Ah. Now that could just be me. Yeah. But that's the message I yeah, hear. Yeah. Yeah. Very good question. In this, Saint John, is it? It's a nice religious place. It's a very good question. Now, I have a tremendous love, respect, reverence for St. Francis, for Jesus Christ, for St. John, for Archbishop Williams of uh, Thomas Berry, many, many great Christian friends. I am in Britain because of my Christian friends. Canon Collins of St. Paul's invited me originally. I started the London School of Nonviolence in St. Martin in the Fields, in the church. My, I appointed the headmaster of my school, a, a, a vicar uh, who was um, a priest, a Christian priest. But I do not have in my mind the idea that the creation and creator are two separate things. I'm not a dualist. I don't think creator and creation can be separated. Can you separate a dance from the dancer? Dance and the dancer are the same. If there's no dance, then there's no dancer. And when there's a dancer, there's a dance. So this is creation of the creator. Create, when I move my arms, it's God moving my arms. When I speak to you, it's God speaking through me. God is here. God is not behind the clouds somewhere else who created the world in six days and then went to sleep on the seventh day. Creation is a continuous process. Creation is not an historical event that 5,000 years ago creation happened and now we are, it's no more creation. Creation is a continuous process. It's a dance of God. It's a movement of God. It's a dynamic God. It's a God present every moment in our heart, in our mind, in our consciousness, in our intelligence, in our creativity, in our words, in our movement, in our food, in our body. God is everywhere. Imminent, present, everywhere. So for me, creation and creator are one and the same thing. I'm not a dualist. I don't know if this uh, fits in your Christian theology or not. So I apologize. I have a tremendous friendship with Christians. I have a great respect for it, but I am not a dualist. I don't separate creation from the creator. Yes. Um, do you have any ideas on dealing with, um, going back to the idea of anger, but dealing with anger and pain and suffering that you might mm. feel in relation to the destruction that's happening on the planet? Mm. Yes. Mm. Now, that's a different kind of anger. When I was talking uh, in this question, I was speaking about violence and how I practice non-violence in my daily life. And that's where I talk about personal anger. But when you feel passion and a kind of, you can say, righteous anger for not on people, but on a system, globalization, imperialism, colonialism, subjugation, wars, uh, um, exploitation of nature, destruction of nature. If you feel passion, kind of anger, and with that you act, then that you have transmuted or transformed um, your anger into energy, passionate energy. And that is a good process. So you use your anger like a compost and put that compost on the roses to grow the roses. That's a wonderful a transformation of your anger into energy to act and change the world. Mahatma Gandhi acted. He was angry against colonialism. Martin Luther King acted. He was angry passionately against uh, civil rights and, and, and against uh, uh, racial discrimination. And, and Nelson Mandela and, 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 and San Suu Kyi and all these great figures. So transforming your anger into energy to transform the world is quite a different order of, of uh, uh, order of thing than your personal anger which you express on your husband or wife or children or colleagues or, or something like that. So that's a different, uh, quite, quite a different context. But in this context, in your context, anger can be compost to grow roses. <laughs> okay, any more questions? There. Can you speak a little bit louder? Small you school? You mentioned a small school that yeah. started in Hartland. Yeah. I, I'm an administrator and I'm very... 
Are you? Yeah, I'm very passionate about, for me, how wrong it's gone. Um, so I don't know what the question is, really, other than, you know, what do, are you still involved in education? Yes, yes, yes. I am involved in the small school on a very small way, not a big way, because now the small school has been going for 30 years. And uh, new parents, new teachers, new energy, new trustees have come. And it's good to let go. I don't want to stay the same project all the time. I want new energy and new people to show their creativity. And I have moved on to be at Schumacher College and, uh, and also uh, publishing and editing magazine, researchers, and going around giving talks and so on and meeting people. So I'm not so much involved. But the small school is going very well and, uh, and still serving very good purpose. And when children come out of the small school, you can see the difference, the confidence they have. And, and they are really not seeking jobs as much as they are creating jobs. Most of our uh, alumni from the small school go out and become self-employed. My son, my daughter, examples, but many others. They have started restaurants, they have started gardens, they have started box schemes, they have started many, many good things, or they have become teachers or something like that. So the confidence which children gain, and they are campaigners, environmentalists, they know nature.